to another edition of the UK Law Weekly Podcast with me, your host, Marcus Cleaver. This week we're going to be looking at the case of SM Algeria and Entry Clearance Officer. The citation for this case, 2018 UKSC 9. And the starting point for the case is to recognise that the free movement of people is a cornerstone of EU law. But there are circumstances and situations in which it is necessary to restrict this freedom. The precise example we will be dealing with is adopted children who, in accordance with Directive 2004-38EC, fall within the right that can be exercised by their parents. There are some exceptions to this, however, including where the child is the victim of exploitation, and so as usual it is up to the courts to seek a resolution that is ultimately in the best interests of the child. With this at the back of our minds, let's have a look at SM's case, who is a young girl from Algeria, adopted under something called the Kafala system. Kafala is the Islamic equivalent of adoption, but the problem is that under this system, a child does not truly become the legal child of its adoptive parents, and will, for example, retain the name of its biological father. In other words, this is not really adoption, but rather the taking care of another person's child. SM's guardians are both from France and were actually married in the UK back in 2001. In 2009, the couple travelled to Algeria, where they were assessed and considered to be suitable guardians. Thus, when SM was abandoned shortly after she was born in 2010, the guardians were able to take legal custody as certified by a deed issued by the Algerian authorities. The husband returned to the UK in 2011, and SM then applied to join him a year later as his adopted child under the UK's implementation of the 2004 directive that we mentioned earlier. When the application came before the entry clearance officer, who is the other party in this case, it was rejected on the basis that Algerian guardianship under the Kafala system is not considered to be an adoption for the purposes of the law in the UK. When the case found its way to the Court of Appeal, they found in favour of the entry clearance officer, holding that it is up to member states like the UK to define terms like adoption and family member. Letting SM into the UK would undermine that privilege and the rules as they both stand. We will soon get the chance to hear the Supreme Court's view on this matter, but there is another issue that came up during this case that we would do well to clear up first. After the Court of Appeal decision, a separate case called Salah and Secretary of State for the Home Department 2016 was heard before the Upper Tribunal, and it was decided that in cases where residency was refused to someone claiming to be an extended family member, there is no right of appeal because, in accordance with Regulation 26 of the UK's implementing regulations, this is not a European Economic Area decision, and therefore doesn't fall within the remit of those regulations. This had the potential to be devastating for SM's own case, as it would undercut her entire appeal, and so the Supreme Court first of all had to decide if it even had jurisdiction to hear the appeal, given the wording of the 2006 regulations and the ruling in Salah. Fortunately for SM, a subsequent judicial review in Khan and Secretary of State for the Home Department 2017 held that Salah was wrongly decided. We don't need to go into too much detail on this point, but it is suffice to say that going back to Article 3 of the original 2004 directive, we can see that there should be a thorough examination of the context and that a member state must justify any denial of entry or residence. Most importantly of all, the Supreme Court agreed with this broader interpretation of Regulation 26, and by implication that it had jurisdiction to hear SM's appeal. The arguments in favour of SM centred around the idea that she fell within the definition of a family member under Article 2.2c of the Directive, as a direct descendant under the age of 21. If not, then still under Article 3.2a, she could still be considered as an other family member who is dependent on a union citizen. A significant problem, however, is that Article 3.2a was not really transposed correctly into UK law by way of the 2006 regulations, 
because it refers to the applicant having to be a relative of a European Economic Area national, rather than simply a dependent. Even if we just think of this situation outside of the legal context, and we ask the person on the street whether they thought SM was a family member, they would most likely agree, and if they didn't, it is hard to deny that SM is at the very least an extended family member, even within the context of the kafala system. Of course, it is not just the Islamic system that we have to consider, and the UK adoption system undoubtedly has a role to play in this case as well. If there was some sort of exploitation or abuse involved, then that would have to be taken into account, and would certainly be grounds for refusal. But on the other hand, just because the kafala system does not strictly abide by UK adoption law, that is not in itself a good enough reason to deny entry. As ever, the fundamental concern is with the welfare of the child, and this requires a careful examination of the evidence, including how well SM is integrated into her new family, and if she is being looked after properly. This all seems pretty straightforward so far, but the one problem that the Supreme Court had trouble with is whether SM could be defined as a direct descendant under Article 2.2c of the Directive, as the term requires a definition that applies across the whole of the EU, but the case law is not clear about what should happen for children in SM's position. When this happens, the court can ask the EU for an interpretation under Article 267 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and that is exactly what they did here with three separate questions for the Court of Justice to answer. Firstly, is a child who is in the permanent legal guardianship of a union citizen or citizens, under kafala or some equivalent arrangement provided for in the law of his or her country of origin, a direct descendant within the meaning of Article 2.2c of the Directive. Secondly, can other provisions in the Directive, in particular Articles 27 and 35, be interpreted so as to deny entry to such children if they are the victims of exploitation, abuse or trafficking, or are at risk of such? And thirdly, is a member state entitled to inquire before recognising a child who is not the consanguineous descendant of the EEA national as a direct descendant under Article 2.2c, into whether the procedures for placing the child into the guardianship or custody of that EEA national was such as to give sufficient consideration to the best interests of the child. It may be a while before the Court of Justice comes back and answers these questions, at which the Supreme Court will be able to make a final decision, but it is pretty safe to say that things look good for SM. Even if the European Court comes back with an answer in the negative as regards Article 2.2c of the Directive, it is surely the case that SM will be allowed to remain on the basis of Article 3. That is the sensible decision and will prevent what is otherwise a rather arbitrary and discriminatory approach by UK immigration authorities that raises serious questions in relation to the right to family life under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. When it comes to all family matters, there are a wide range of approaches across the globe that vary according to social, cultural and religious practices. Just because a country does not operate on strictly Western values does not make those approaches invalid so long as they respect basic human rights and the overarching welfare of the child. While we are still a part of the European Union, it is incumbent upon the courts of the United Kingdom to facilitate this right. But in many ways, this case is symptomatic of a rather nasty trend in domestic jurisprudence that seems intent on carrying out the government's own unscrupulous immigration policy on their behalf. The Salah case that we mentioned earlier is the clearest example of this, And speaking frankly, it should never have been decided by the upper tribunal in such a way as to eliminate the right of appeal in these cases. Doing so goes against the entire spirit of the legislation and diminishes the rule of law, a concept that ought to provide protection to everyone, especially the most vulnerable. In the end, there is only one important fact in this case, and it bears no relation to nationality or immigration politics. SM is being brought up in a loving, caring family, 
and that is what matters. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of the UK Law Weekly podcast, and thanks as ever to bensound.com who provide the theme music. Also, special thanks to Fredita, who left a review for the um, podcast on iTunes. That's very much appreciated, and they gave it a five-star review, um, which was brilliant, so thank you very much for that. Remember, you can also uh, leave a review on iTunes as well, and I'll give you a shout-out on the podcast, um, because it's certainly very much appreciated, and certainly inspires me to carry on doing this. Um, I'll be back next week with another case, but in the meantime... Thanks very much for listening. Bye.